In this section, we start looking outside our cube plot. What happens when we leave that range from minus 1 to plus 1 that we've been so focused on? We're going to add a new tool to our toolkit that we use to analyze the data, the concept called response surface methods. Now in the next video, we will consider in depth the case of a single factor. Most practical systems though have two or more factors that affect the outcome. But if you understand the idea for one factor, then the subsequent videos will make more sense. I'll explain what response surface methods are in this video and why you would want to use them. And in the remainder of the videos, we'll see them in action. When I use data to improve a process or a system, in my experience, I find that I'm inevitably trying to achieve one of these five objectives. Trying to learn more or increase my knowledge of the system. Maybe I'm troubleshooting the process. Or perhaps I'm using the data to make some form of prediction. Or maybe I'm trying to optimize the system in some way. Or finally, I might just be monitoring the process based on the data to make sure that I'm retaining all those performance gains I've made in the past. Those of you taking the course and working in a company, you will find that any project or task you do likely falls into one of these five categories. Think back about the past few projects you've been working on. The biggest problem I often encounter is that people don't have their objectives clearly in mind. Once you've figured out your objective, picking the simplest approach and using the appropriate tools to solve that problem becomes apparent. In the prior four modules of this course, we have focused only on the first three objectives listed here. We've hinted a little bit at the fourth one, trying to optimize the process in some way. For that first objective, we've seen how we can learn which factors are important and eliminate which are not. This improves our overall understanding of the system. To quote George Box, discovering the unexpected is more important than confirming the unknown. Really think about your experimental results and interpret them every time. The concepts learnt in this course can also be used to troubleshoot a problem. If your boss comes to you with a problem, you can brainstorm a list of five, six or more factors that are potentially the cause. Then, using fractional factorial ideas from Module 4, you can quickly identify which factors are actually related to the issue by running a screening experiment. And right since the second module of this course, we've been making predictions based on our experimental results, so you're comfortable with that idea. Now in this section, we're going to be optimizing our processes. Let's go back to a familiar system, making popcorn. Let's say you were simply investigating two factors, cooking time as factor A and the type of oil as factor B. And I'm going to use the number of unburnt popcorn as the outcome variable. You'll see why I chose this. Unburnt popcorn are those popcorn that have popped but not burned, the white popcorn. We want to maximize this outcome variable. That's the objective of my experiments. And here are the results on a cube plot. So you can quickly see that factor B, the type of oil, has almost no effect on the outcome. Notice that the first objective of the five was used here. We learned that in our system, the type of oil over this range of cooking times seems to have little impact on the outcome. It doesn't mean that oil type is totally irrelevant. It simply says that over the range of cooking times used in this experiment, oil type seems to have little effect. Also notice that we could learn that the AB interaction is not significant. We can see that in the Pareto plot as well as in the contour plots. Visually, this means we could collapse our square down to a single line. Let's go apply that third objective now and build a predictive model for the system. Y equals 90 plus 15xA. Note that we don't have to include factor B or the AB interaction in our model because we've determined that B is not useful. Here is the R code and you will get the exact same result with any statistical software. Just a brief recap on the interpretation of the 15 times xA term in the model. That says, when we increase the cooking time from minus 1 to 0, or from 0 to plus 1 in coded units, in other words, a 1 unit increase, then the number of popped but unburned popcorn increases on average by a value of 15. Now response surface methods, or response surface optimization, uses the idea that this model can tell us where to move to next. We're going to build on our existing experiments over here to figure out what happens over there. 
We have figured out already that factor B does not play an important role in the system. So response surface methods are used after you have already completed your screening experiments. That's an important point. Don't include factors in the optimization that have little or no effect on the outcome. Then once we build a model based on the important factors, we can now go use it to tell us where to move to next. We can see here that we should be moving towards the right to increase our objective. Now we can never expect the model to tell us exactly or perfectly what will happen over there on the right as we move towards that region. There is no way that this simple model summarizes all the laws of physics, heat transfer, and the complex chemical reactions taking place when popcorn is popping. The simple model, also referred to by the name of an empirical model, is a great approximation and provides good guidance on where to move to next. That is what response surface methods are about in a nutshell. Efficient sequential experiments to reach an optimum using only the important factors after you've done a preliminary screening design.